On Tech News Today, Apple sold a million watches on day one, LinkedIn wants companies to share stuff internally, and the Chinese government breaks the record for the longest hack attack ever, 10 years. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, April 13th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to harrys.com. Get $5 off your first purchase by entering the code TNT when you check out. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Visa gift card when you get a loan. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news of the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin, your friendly neighborhood anchor. Our co-anchor today is CNET Editor-in-Chief Lindsay Turrentine. How are you doing, Lindsay? I'm doing great. I'm still recovering from my TV hangover, but otherwise, yeah. it's a good Monday. Big Sunday for TV uh, yesterday, and you were telling me before the show that you uh, saw both Game of Thrones and Silicon Valley, and you thought that Game of Thrones was a little slow, but what did you think of Silicon Valley? So I thought that the first half of the show was a little, and then it got very funny when they got deep into the VC world. Um, funny, funny, funny stuff. There's nothing funnier than venture capital. I tell you, no, I, I love a show that can make venture capital funny. And also it looks like the story arc this year is going to wrap around CES. Oh, really? Instead of TechCrunch Disrupt. Yeah. Really? That's, yeah. that's, that's awesome. <laughs> and they'll probably actually uh, be at, uh, at the next CES in person because why not? I hope so. so. All right. Well, let's jump into the news. A company called Slice Intelligence is estimating Apple Watch sales based on a survey of over 9,000 buyers. They concluded, among other things, that Apple sold more than a million smartwatches on the first day of pre-orders. Kevin Tofel is a contributing writer for ZDNet and joins us to talk about it. Welcome to you, Kevin. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. Thanks for being on. Now, Apple sold more than a million watches, according to Slice, but to less than a million people. The average buyer got 1.3 watches. Is this generally above or below expectations? How does this match uh, what people expected? You know, that's a great question because expectations have been all over the map for the Apple Watch. There are the naysayers saying it's going to be a bomb. Uh, there are analysts saying there'll be 20 odd million sales in the first year alone. I figured between one and, million, one and two million sales in the opening weekend. And I should point out that Slice's data, it's really a subset, as you had mentioned, of um, people who use the Slice application. I'm actually one of those people who use it. They actually capture the email receipts for things you purchase online. And then they can gather up that data and and make extrapolations upon that. Um, you know, it's again about one million watches in the first day, and that's specifically in the U.S. So we don't even have numbers for outside the U.S. yet. So it's possible that you know Apple Watch first weekend pre-orders could well be into the two three million area, which wouldn't surprise me at all. So Kevin, I when I ordered mine, and I think I have the same story you do. I tried to order the Sport Space Gray with the black band and immediately was back ordered. I mean, I was right there at, at midnight and couldn't get my order until mid-May. Um, which ones were the most popular? I'm assuming based on my experience that that watch was the most popular. What do you know? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in the same camp. I, I tried to order the uh, Space Gray with uh, Sports Edition with black uh, wrist strap and at 3.07 on the East Coast, my time, seven minutes after order started, it was, you know, already put into May. So I won't see mine until you see yours. Um, you know, it looks as though, and I'm guess I'm not, again, not surprised because of the pricing, it looks as though the Sport Edition, which starts at 3.49 or is 3.99 in the larger model, was the more popular one. I think Slice said that um, it was apparently 61%, nearly two-thirds of the people ordered the lower-priced Apple Watches. It's really not hurting Apple, though, because quite a few people did order that uh, regular Apple Watch that starts at $549 or $599, plus there are band options. And 25% of the people who ordered bands ordered that Milanese or Milanese Loop for $149, pushing the average price of those particular watch sales up to like the $707 mark. So clearly the Apple Watch Sport Edition, the low cost one was more popular. But again, when it all works out with the, at the end of the day with the numbers, I don't think Apple's going to be hurt that much. Now, Apple did a really uh, uh, intelligent thing, which is that they 
they have two sizes, a bigger one and a smaller one. They're both on the large size, as smart watches tend to be. But they didn't call them the women's watch and the men's watch, uh, as as uh, jewelry store watches tend to do. They tend to have like, here's all the women's watches and here's all the men's watches. And so I'm seeing a lot of men getting the smaller one, and I'm seeing women getting the larger one. And so there's a general, you know, there's a general tendency for men to get the larger and so on. But it's it's uh, basically a choice, um, uh, an individual choice. Which one is selling uh, best, the big one or the small one? I believe it's the big one, according to Slice and their data. Um, that's a 42 millimeter watch. I actually collect analog watches, so a 42 millimeter watch is about the right size for me. It's about pushing it for me. I did order the 38 millimeter because I do have smaller wrists, but uh, I think it's 71 percent of the watches sold were the larger size. The nice thing here is, Mike, as you've said, there's a choice. Um, even with the Sport Edition, you're getting both the, the small, medium, and the medium large band with that watch. So you you have even further choice after you order your watch, depending on which which band you take. But this is probably the first time I've seen any smartwatch that kind of catered to having that choice between smaller and larger, presumably for men or for women. And, you know, a lot of women have said with the other smartwatches, this is just too ginormous for me. I can't wear this. Now they have a choice. What's interesting to me, Kevin, is that if if we're assuming that most women would order the smaller one, I did, um, and most men would order the larger one, although obviously both can happen, uh, it seems to me that most of these watches were pre-ordered by men, or that's likely. And I wonder, I don't think there's anything in this report unless you saw something that I didn't read about the gender breakdown of the orders. And I wonder if Apple is going to be trying to push harder for women, presuming it didn't get that many orders from women. Yeah, that's a good observation. I would assume it was mostly uh, men that were buying them, and it doesn't look like too many men bought many for their women. So, um, yeah, it, my guess is Apple will continue to push the whole fashion aspect of this. This is a, a new you know, space for them, a new market for them. And with the fashion aspect, I think you will see more women be interested in this watch in the future. Um, again, more so than the other smartwatches that are out there, the competing smartwatches, because A, they're bigger and B, they're, you know, maybe a little a little bit too clunky looking for, for the women to, you know, want to wear on the, uh, as a night out on the town or something like that. It's interesting because we're talking about these sales and these are actual sales, people actually ordering uh, these smartwatches, but these are pre-orders. This watch has not actually been out in the wild unless you're a uh, celebrity at Coachella or something like that. And so that's that's kind of a, a major uh, fact to, to be considered. Uh, but how does this compare with Android Wear or, say, Pebble? Like, how does this Apple Watch, let's just go with a million figure. I mean, I know it's only mm -hmm. U.S. and it's only from Slice, but let's just assume that they sold a million the first day, or let's say for the weekend maybe. I think you estimated in your article 2 point something million maybe for the weekend, something like that. How does this compare to Android Wear and the other alternatives? Well, uh, we can look at both of those because we have figures from both Pebble and for Android Wear. Pebble's been around the longest. I think the Kickstarter was back in 2012. And it was just at the end of December, the end of 2014, that Pebble said, we just shipped our millionth watch. Now, that was before they announced their new Pebble Time, which, again, that was pretty popular and so on and so forth. But at least we have an actual figure there. It took them almost two years to ship one million watches. As far as Android Wear, we only have some information that came out uh, maybe two months ago, and that was that approximately 720,000 Android Wear watches were shipped in 2014. Bear in mind, those watches didn't even start shipping until the middle of the year, so it's not a full year. Many vendors or hardware partners didn't even start shipping Android Wear until September, October, November. So again, not a full year, but already it's a safe bet to say that the Apple Watch has exceeded Android Wear sales, uh, depending on assuming, or I guess I should say assuming that Slice Intelligence data is accurate. Uh, Kevin, you're one of the uh, GigaOM refugees. It's amazing how fast you guys all got hired, <laughs> got snapped up by the industry. Now, how's that going for you? I mean, I have to say that it was a good move on uh, on on ZDNet's part to hire you. That was uh, uh, very good, and they had to move quick, as I said. But how's it going for you? I, I can't complain. I mean, obviously, my peers and I all went through a situation that was beyond our control. As Honestly, as far as we knew, we were doing well. 
Um, so there was a, a shock factor for all of us and we had some time to commiserate. And honestly, I feel very humbled and blessed that I had a couple of different opportunities to consider. Um, I'm happy to have ended up at ZDNet and I'm, I'm super excited for my most of my peers who ended up at Fortune, which is uh, a top-notch publication as well. So um, all I can say is, again, very happy, very humbled to have a home and very appreciative of the people that have followed us to, to our new homes. Yeah, Fortune was a snapping up uh, GigaOM writers <laughs> like they were at Costco or something. I think, what did they get, six people? Yeah, they uh, they got at least six. Um, and it's a good fit for the people who went there. I knew it was not a place for me because of the uh, of the audience there. I'm more of a consumer type person as opposed to more a B2B type person and such. But uh, uh, yeah, that's a great fit for those people. Well, you can now find Kevin Tofel at ZDNet.com. And you can always find Kevin at Kevin C. Tofel on Twitter. Thanks for joining us, Kevin. Thanks again, Mike. All right. Got some more no uh, news for you in just a sec, including a really interesting hack story coming out of China. But first, I want to tell you about Harry's. You know, I think you, if you've been buying uh, razor bl and razor blades for a long time, you can kind of tell that it's a bit of a racket. <laughs> they sell you the, the, the razors really uh, cheaply. And then when you go to buy the blades, they're up to like $4 a blade. Uh, they keep them in this like jewelry case. It's almost like an Apple Watch or something like that. You go to the store to get them because they are making so much money on these blades that they're a high value item, but they don't need to be. There's a lot of shenanigans that have been going on for a long time in the razor and razor blade industry. And one company is here to sort of reverse all of that. It's Harry's. Uh, what they did in order to break this sort of like monopolistic behavior of the of the razor blade companies is they made their own razors. They bought a factory in Germany to make their own blades. And then they ship them free to you at very, very low cost. These are super high quality blades at very, very low cost. This is the quality that you should get and the price you should pay. Uh, if And it's the price you would pay if in fact the whole industry wasn't uh, sort of playing these sort of games with uh, with blades. Um, each kit, it comes in a kit, you can get a kit, these kits, um, one of which is called the Truman Set. It's an amazing deal, just $15, and you get uh, razor blades, you get uh, the razor, you get foaming gel, uh, they, and there are multiple kits you can check out uh, that run the gamut, but they're all ex you know conspicuously affordable and really, really good prices here. Um, they cost, you know, Harry's costs about half as much as the razors you'd get at the store. It's really an amazing uh, uh, product in that sense. And also the quality is really, really great as well. So just go to harrys.com and you'll get $5 off your first purchase if you use the code TNT. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. Enter the code TNT at checkout. And we thank Harry's for their support of Tech News Today. LinkedIn today launched an app called Elevate, which is designed to encourage employees within a company to share content to groups internally. Kurt Wagner writes for Recode and joins us to talk about Elevate. How you doing, Kurt? Hey, what's up, Mike? I'm doing well. Uh, not much. Uh, so what is the purpose of this product? Why would a company want to use Elevate? So the reason uh, companies might want to use Elevate is that they found out that their employees actually reach a lot more people and have a lot more influence than the companies themselves when they're sharing content on LinkedIn. And so what I mean by that is if I share a story um, from Recode, in theory, that's going to get more reach and, and more influence than if, if Recode shares a story. And so uh, this is primarily for bigger companies. So like a Google, for example, instead of pushing out a blog post about engineering, they might ask all their engineers, hey, will you guys share this to your networks? Will, will you pass this along? And they found that that generates more profile views and more job, uh, more people coming to look at job postings from the company. And so I think LinkedIn's trying to help companies use LinkedIn by utilizing their employees. So Kurt, you wrote that this is also an analytics tool. What, how, does, how do the analytics work and why would that be an important part of this tool? So the analytics, and I kind of touched on it right there at the end, is that these companies want to understand, okay, so if this, uh, if this blog post, for example, that we wanted to share out there and our, our employees are sharing it to their networks, is that driving a lot of people to come check out a specific job posting? If so, they might know, okay, we really did a good job of conveying what the, what the mission was all about in this post. Or if no one comes and looks at the job, maybe they say, okay, this post wasn't really that great about conveying what we wanted it to, wanted it to say. Um, so I think it's like any company that's doing marketing, any company that's, that's trying to drive kind of social engagement, 
the metrics enable these these uh, elevate clients to figure out what's working and what's not. What are their followers or people interested in the company uh, caring about? And so I think that's kind of where that, that that part fits in. Is this just for jobs, or is this also for like marketing the company's products? No, no, it's for marketing the company's products. Um, you know, if the CEO writes something really interesting and they say, "Hey, this would be great." Um, to, to spread out there. We're going to share it through Elevate and then our employees are going to get it and they're going to be able to easily reshare it to their networks. So it's essentially anything that the company feels would be beneficial for them or, or uh, you know, helpful. And then LinkedIn, of course, is, is also saying, well, hey, this is also beneficial to the employees themselves because if I am sharing more, I'm going to have more people checking out my profile as well. So as an employee, uh, the more you share, the more activity there's going to be around your own profile. So they're kind of pegging this as a win-win for both companies and employees. I think it's a little bit more a benefit to the company themselves, right? They have their employees kind of sharing out content on their behalf. Um, but in theory, the more you share, the more people are going to check out your page. So this costs money, right? How much does it, it cost? Does. And, and, and why do you think it's a, a, it's a paid product? Well, the reason I think it's paid is because I, I think it benefits companies, right? I mean, they're able to um, essentially drive more traffic to their job postings and their pages. And so that's, that's, ben that's beneficial to them to the point that they may be willing to pay for this. Uh, there is not a set price yet. LinkedIn says that they're still kind of experimenting. It's just right now uh, being rolled out with some pilot companies. So it's not broadly available. It won't be until Q3 is what they say. Um, but yeah, the, I, I think that there's a reason they're charging for it, right? Is that it provides a benefit to companies. I don't think that regular LinkedIn users would pay for it, but if you're Google or if you're Apple or Facebook, whoever it is, and you think, all right, this may bring uh, more recruits to checking out our job postings or coming to our page to hear what we're all about as a company, that's, that's worth the money to them. Sounds to me like kind of a bummer for employees. I agree with you, Kurt, and it's going to benefit the companies. I mean, personally, I tweet a lot of stuff about Twit, but that's because Twit is like really a fun, interesting place. If I work for some boring company, that you know, I wouldn't want the company always like uh, harassing me to like promote mm -hmm. the company. And you know, talk about driving more traffic. I, you know, I think a lot of people who do social networking don't want more traffic, and they're certainly not going to get more traffic if what they're posting is like essentially spam or you know, job you know, information or whatever. So um, I'm not really sure that this is uh, something that employees want. And if employees don't want it and don't want to use it, then it could create a problem. But we'll see how it goes. We'll check in on this yeah. product and see uh, if uh, if companies are benefiting or how people are using it. So uh, we'll, yeah, we'll take a I look. Mean, Go ahead. One thing, sorry, if I, if I just, you know, leave with one thought is that I, I do agree with you, uh, Mike. And, and I, the one thing that LinkedIn, of course, would argue is that, well, these employees have a choice, right? I mean, the employer is saying, hey, here are some articles we think are interesting. We'd love for you to share them. That doesn't mean the employee actually has to do it. They could simply tune it out. And the other thing I found interesting is that they made this a separate app. And so it requires kind of another step. Employees would have to download an Elevate app as opposed to just simply having the LinkedIn app on their phone. So there are a few steps that employees would have to take in order to make this kind of beneficial. So it'll be interesting, as you said, to see if employees actually get on board and say, oh, you know, some of the stuff my, my employer wants me to share really is interesting, or if they just simply blow it all off as, as kind of a company speak. Interesting. Very interesting product development here. Kurt Wagner is at Recode.net, and you can follow him on Twitter at KurtWagner8. Thanks for joining us today, Kurt. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. The Chinese government is most likely behind a cyber espionage ring called APT30, which is targeting governments, companies, and journalists in Southeast Asia, India, and other countries. The sustained attack effort has lasted more than a decade, and the news comes from U.S. security company FireEye. It's actually in Milpitas, California. One element of the attacks is malware intended to find its way to computer systems that are not physically connected to the Internet. This malware jumps from the Internet-connected systems of these various people when they're at work, and then it leaps over to USB thumb drives when they enter thumb drives into their systems. Then it jumps onto their home computers when they put the thumb drives into the home computers. And then when they put a portable hard drive into their home computer, it jumps onto the hard drive. And then when they take that hard drive back to work and connect it to an air-gapped or non-connected -con computer, the malware jumps to there. It's just an astonishing thing, uh, Lindsay Turntine, that they've been doing this for a decade. This is, appears to be the world record for a sustained approach to hacking. It's, this group has been 
uh, doing this successfully for a decade, and nobody until now has detected it. It's really amazing. It, what, what surprised me about this report is how regimented this group seems to be. They are very well structured. The report says that they work in shifts. Um, they're super organized and what seems like very professional in their approach to hacking, uh, which makes it even scarier. Yeah, it really does. And again, this is a, this has, you know, it's a, it's a Chinese uh, operation, apparently, uh, most likely. And so it's geared around cyber, cyber espionage. There's also a lot of effort before the Chinese government goes to meet at these various international conferences, there's a big sustained hack attack to gather all the information they can get so that they had an advantage in the negotiations, whatever it is that's going on. So um, it's really, uh, really kind of an amazing uh, uh, effort. And again, that is APT30. That's the name of the organization that's most likely state sponsored within China that's doing this hack. Well, LG may have accidentally leaked details and pictures of its own upcoming G4 flagship smartphone. The company appears to have embedded the URL for an unfinished promotional website for the G4 inside the source code for a G4 teaser page. The page has now been removed, but not before Boy Genius Report grabs screenshots of it. Based on that leak, it appears that the rumors about the G4 are true. It's got a feature called Personal Experience, that learns and adapts to each user, according to the company. And the phone has a 5.5-inch screen, powerful removable battery, and a 16-megapixel camera that LG thinks is really good. And it better be good because Apple has a great camera and Samsung has a really great camera on their flagship phones. Uh, the site also features swappable leather backplates. Lindsay Turntine, does this, uh, this phone look like it's going to be special enough? Is you know. I'm sure the leather enthusiasts will enjoy it, but is there anything else here that uh, is going to be uh, enable them to compete against the likes of Apple and Samsung? Well, from what, you know, at CNET, we've taken a really close look at the predecessors to this phone, and we've always been the recently very, very impressed with what LG is doing, actually. We've just, the fit and finish of these phones, the functionality and the speed of these phones has been very good. So LG's problem, and, or I guess challenge up until this point, is marketing. And LG needs to find a way to market this phone. It sounds like the the adaptability and the idea that this phone is going to learn who you are and, and what you're what you like is a good marketing tactic. And I have to say, as just a consumer, the leather backs are really pretty. Um, and, and they come in a really wide variety of colors. I, I like them. And I think that at the very least, they'll get people's attention because it's a new way of thinking about a case. So I'm bullish about this. I mean, LG is always the underdog, but I think this is looks like it's going to be a really nice phone. Yes, it does. And of course, having the back on a phone is very important. Uh, getting it right is very difficult, apparently, for companies. I mean, if you if you think about the iPhone 6 or 6 Plus uh, without a case, it's just, personally, I find it unholdable. It's just, it's slippery and it's, it's awkward to hold. Uh, even the Moto X, which uh, famously had wood-backed, uh, I had one of the wood-backed Moto X phones and it was really slippery. Um, so something like leather is both really nice. It has it reminds people of a premium product, and at the same time, it's very grippy and 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 holdable. So um, you know, I think OnePlus has uh, had a lot of success with uh, you know interesting backs, and so this is one area that I think companies are not doing enough uh, on, and it's great to see them doing that. They they, they actually look really good. Well, ASUS is expected to launch tomorrow a new smartwatch called the Vivo Watch which is rumored to get 10 days of battery life. That's a little bit more than the Apple Watch's one day. <laughs> According to hints from Asus chairman Johnny Shi, the watch will be geared toward fitness and won't run Android wear. The Vivo watch is expected to have a stainless steel body and be water and dust resistant, plus offer heart rate monitoring and sleep tracking. You know, it's interesting, you know, obviously smartwatches have divided themselves into two categories. There's the fitness band type of products, and then there's the smartwatch type of products. This is actually a fitness band that looks like a smartwatch, so it can be worn as a watch to business meetings and things like that, but it's actually geared toward uh, fitness. And, you know, 10 days of battery life, I mean, this will, this will satisfy a lot of people who are complaining about the battery life of some of the bigger uh, smartwatches. Yeah, in some ways, this reminds me of the Withings Activite Pop, which got a lot yeah. of um, a lot of attention at CES. And we always joke that saying Activite makes you sound like Cartman. <laughs> um, Activite. 
<laughs> but the, the, it, this, the approach to this watch reminds me of the approach to the Activité Pop because it's, as you said, essentially a watch that is a fitness band or a fitness band that is a watch that lasts a very long time. Of course, the Activité Pop lasts much, much longer than this because it uses traditional uh, embedded watch batteries. But this is a it, this is pretty nice looking. It's very sleek and attractive. And I think that if, you know, it's smart of Asus to come out right after, if you're going to have to come out after the Apple Watch, you might as well come out with something completely different. Now, although I do think it's curious that it doesn't run Android Wear. Yeah. This is really basic. Yeah, and I think that if it did run Android Wear, it would be more of a smartwatchy kind of a smartwatch and it probably wouldn't get 10 days of battery life. So, you know, my, my feeling is that, you know, the, the main things people want from a smartwatch is they want it to be a watch that they can wear and have it be convincingly a watch instead of this geek thing lashed to their wrist. And so it has to look like a real watch that, you know, stylish and that sort of thing. Secondly, I think people want notifications, right, from smartphone notifications on their wrist. And be able to do simple things like play music or answer the phone or whatever. And thirdly, they want some sort of fitness uh, activity. And beyond that, everything else is frosting on the cake. And if you can radically lower the price and 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 crank up the battery life uh, by abandoning some of the gingerbread that you find on like the Apple Watch, the super high resolution screen, the heart, you know, the sort of heartbeat thing, the Taptic uh, engine and all the rest, then I think they're going to get a lot of people who don't want to pay that kind of money for an Apple Watch, don't want to wait till June, uh, don't want one day battery life. So it's probably a very good strategy, like you say. Sure. And I mean, like it price is the rub, right? That we don't know the price for this yet. If it can be pretty inexpensive, right? If we can get it down to just over a hundred dollars, that could be really compelling. I, I think it depends on a couple of other things too, right? Are there swappable bands? Are there choices other than this black one? But we'll see. Yeah. And, and I think, I, I'm not sure if we, uh, we mentioned it, um, during the, um, during the uh, segment with uh, Kevin Toffel, but I believe that the average price of the Apple Watch is turning, according to the the, the slice uh, information, is turning out to be in the mid seven hundred dollar range. So this is essentially, if you want to say how much does an Apple Watch cost, of course, the, there's a wide price range that goes all all the way up to above seventeen thousand dollars. But the average smartwatch uh, Apple Watch appears to be seven hundred and something dollars. I mean that's far more expensive than most people pay for a high-end smartphone. So, that, Well, true. But however, that could be if you throw in a, just a few purchases of the very, very expensive Apple Watch, it could throw off that average. I mean, it seems like most people are spending the, the lower price and then you just throw in that very, very high price watch and it throws everything off. Yeah, good point. Well, I, when this dust clears, hopefully Apple will speak to all of this data uh, in a sort of the bragging sort of way that they tend to open their uh, <laughs> their keynotes with uh, at uh, their WWDC event uh, in, uh, coming up shortly uh, this summer. Uh, so we'll have to probably wait until then until we get real data, but it's uh, they're making a lot of money. Let's just, uh, long story short, they're making a ton of money and a lot of people don't want to spend that kind of money. So it's great to see these alternatives coming out. Well, in product update news, Amazon's X-Ray search feature is coming to the Fire TV. The feature, which was previously available for Amazon content on the Kindle e-reader and Kindle Fire tablet, enables users to ask, who's that actor or who's that actress? And X-Ray displays the name and offers to share more information about the person. X-Ray also identifies music in TV shows and movies, but the feature works only with Amazon Instant Video content. Well, That's yeah. I I I just have to say I want this now because yeah. I'm always sitting there on the couch with my husband and we're those people who are like, oh, it's that guy, it's that guy, you know, the guy from the thing. I can't enjoy the show anymore <laughs> when there's like an actor or an actress that like I know what they were in, but where did I see them? So yeah, it's good. Yeah, I mean, future. you can always Google it, but what's the fun in that? Yeah, exactly. Just talk to the TV. Well, um, more news in a sec, but first let me tell you about. Prosper. Prosper is the greatest way to borrow money. You don't want to go to the bank and you don't want to borrow from friends and family and, and, and other people that you know. You want to do it the Silicon Valley way. You want to borrow money uh, in a way that's going to have people investing in you and your project. You can do uh, all kinds of things with a Prosper loan. You can uh, pay off high rate credit cards. You can fix up your house. You can even put it into your small business. You can borrow up to $35,000 in as few as five days. And, uh, you know, again, 
no matter what you want to do th with this money, this is the way to borrow it. Don't rack up more debt on your credit cards. You can pay them off with a loan from Prosper. And you can check your low rate instantly without affecting your good credit. Just go to prosper.com slash twit. And now for a limited time, Prosper is offering Twit viewers and listeners a $50 Visa gift card with your new low interest loan. You can get up to $35,000 in your account in as few as five days and a $50 Visa gift card. Go to prosper.com slash twit for this special offer just for Twit fans. We've got a big number for you today, $206 billion. That's the new market cap in U.S. dollars of China's Tencent Holdings at the close of trading today. The new stock price of $22 per share makes Tencent more valuable now than either IBM or Amazon. Well, in news you can lose, Recode's Lauren Good has been publishing a video series on smartwatch etiquette. Her fourth rule hit today, and the rule is don't be that person who uses Siri or Google now all the time. Her video features, features reaction shot cameos from a number of Recode journalists who are frequent guests on TNT, including Kurt Wagner, who was on the show earlier today. Let's take a look at rule number four. Don't become that person that uses Siri all the time. By the way, the same goes with Android smartwatches. What's the age range for millennials? Okay, Google, where do I find Carmel? So that's Lauren Shears? Good that's talking. Cute. Okay, Google. There's Carmel to hey, Amicus. Siri. Okay, Google. Hey, Siri. Okay, Google. There's okay, Kurt Wagner. Google. <laughs> hey, Siri. Go, go, Power Rangers. Hey, Siri. What's the best place around here to hide a dead body? So they're doing <laughs> shtick now. Tech journalists are doing shtick. Oh, tech journalists have been doing shtick for decades Yeah, but now, now they're publishing it. <laughs> exactly. She has a point, though. I mean, you know, it's funny. Uh, at our household dinner table, we are not allowed to Google things at the dinner table. And that was not a rule set by the adults. Really? The kids, mm -hmm. the kids are like tired of you, of, of mom and dad, like Googling everything. Yeah. They're like, well, cause Willie said, well, let's look it up. And the kids are like, no, 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 no more. <laughs> Let it, you know, iceberg lettuce is too good for you. Oh yeah. Well, uh, tch, tch, tch. Go. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, we got some, uh, we got some email feedback from uh, some TNT fans we were talking mostly about the Apple Watch. Uh, we got one from Neil Duitz who said, Hi, Mike. Love the show. I always learn something on TNT and other Twitch shows. And I'm writing to let you know that I ordered the stainless steel Milanese Loop. That's the one that uh, we mentioned earlier that costs, I think, $150 extra, something like that. And uh, he's looking forward to receiving it on the 24th. So he's one of the, uh, presumably a April 24th. Um, that That's Amazing. He's one of the chosen few who's getting it uh, right off the bat. We got another uh, email from Yakov uh, Gorondinsky, who wrote that it's truly baffling to me how Apple can say that you have to charge your watch every night. And everyone says, yep, that's about right. My LG G Watch R lasts 50 plus hours on a charge. How is charging every day acceptable? Your most recent reviewer mentioned that being 18% by 10 p.m., and that's okay. I'm at 70% by 10 p.m. with heavy use. How is Apple not running circles around the LG in the battery department? My guess is, uh, Yakov, that the battery in the Apple Watch is probably pretty powerful, but the problem is that it has a high-resolution screen and it burns a lot of uh, energy. It's not energy efficient in terms of uh, how it's you know compared to a uh, lower-resolution screen and uh, a, a watch that doesn't have the Taptic engine and, and so on. And so, yeah, it's a battery is is a big problem for the Apple Watch. And so, for people who don't want to charge it every day, uh, it's a huge problem. I think that one of the things, one of the ways, and and I don't know how you feel about this, Lindsay, turn time, but I'm guessing that we're seeing a lot of complaints about the Apple Watch in that it just doesn't differentiate in what sorts of notifications it sends to the watch. It's sending everything to the watch, and people are being annoyed by these constant notifications. And Apple's going to have to figure out some way to intelligently filter which notifications make it to the watch and which don't. And sure. that will help battery life, I think, as well. There's a, I mean, there's a lot that they're going to have to do. And this first generation of people all rushing to buy the Apple Watch at midnight when it went on sale last week are the guinea pigs. We're the ones who are going to help Apple sort that stuff out. Our reviewer, Scott Stein from CNET, he had, I think, almost a bigger problem with the battery than most reviewers did, partially because he has tested just about every smartwatch and fitness band out there. And he likes being able to sleep with the watch on 
he sleeps with his watch anyway. Uh. And for somebody who sleeps with a band on, obviously you can't do it with the Apple Watch, which limits the Apple Watch. And, it, and you might have noticed that the Apple Watch didn't come with sleep tracking ability. It's got, a, according to Scott, really great fitness tracking, yeah. but really crummy sleep tracking. And that's because, well, if they had built sleep trafficking into the watch, everyone would have been furious. You just can't wear it at night. So that's, it's definitely a frustration. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we got one more commenting on the uh, Apple Watch. It comes from Derek Morrison, who wrote, Hello, TNT crew. I, wrote, I woke up this morning to find some Apple Watch deliveries estimated to occur in June. I don't think there's any other tech company that could tease the public for nine months and get away with it. That's almost an entire product cycle. Version 2 will be available for a little peekaboo only three months after some of the Apple faithful finally get the watch. That's a prediction there. It's clear that Apple was afraid of being left out of the watch race, and they decided to, cl uh, to clock a block. <laughs> I love that. Smartwatch buyers with this exceptionally long introduction and rollout. Thanks for the great show and best guests on the planet. I agree with that. Uh, and... You know, what they're what he's talking about here is FUD, fear, uncertainty, a doubt. This is something that's a, a a venerable Silicon Valley tradition where if you're not ready with your product, you do things that make people uh, worry about getting the competitor because they're going to miss what whatever it is that you're doing. And um, you know, I think Apple does this. You know, has to do this to a certain extent. They did it with the iPhone. They announced it uncharacteristically, months before it shipped back in 2007. Steve Jobs introduced it in January, even though they didn't ship it till the summer. And so uh, this is something that I think they pretty much had to do for exactly the reason Derek uh, is explaining. Uh, any thoughts on this, uh, Lindsay Turrentine? Uh, no, not not really. I mean, I think that it's true that there's a fair amount of fatigue and we were feeling that in our in reader response a little bit. I mean, people definitely were interested in the Apple Watch over the past week, but it felt tepid, honestly, compared to uh, an iPhone launch cycle, for yep. sure. And maybe that's because people are not familiar with the product, but we've kind of felt that all along. Yeah, absolutely. And again, they've got a, a huge cultural barrier to overcome Namely, that people, you know, younger people don't wear watches anymore. So they've got to convince people to do an entirely different behavior if they're going to go after that mass market. You look at the Android Wear. Android Wear in our circles, in, in, in geek circles, uh, Lindsay, uh, seems like everybody's got one. But in fact, they sold, you know, less than three quarters of, of, of a million of them. So, you know, it's, it's really a, a, an uphill battle for the entire industry to convince people to wear watches again. I think they'll do it. But again, like you say, I think that the Apple Watch and some of these other high-end watches have to be out there in the market for a while. You're really not going to buy it by hearing about it uh, on blogs and things like that. You're going to want one when you see one on an airplane. You see somebody using a smartwatch that looks really cool, and you're going to say, wait, wait a minute, that looks really cool, and I think I'm going to get one. That's it's yeah, going to take there has years. To be there has to be a killer personal feature for you too. Um, and, you know, for, for me, the killer feature is I need to know what I'm talking about. But for most people, there's just going to be one aspect of that device that really speaks to them and their lifestyle. And I think each manufacturer is going to have to find what that is. Yeah, absolutely true. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Brad Johnson in Peoria, Illinois, who posted this video on Facebook. You're not going to believe this, folks. Just watch it. I... You can't make this kind of stuff up. Check this out. Million PC shipped worldwide, according to Gardner, or just 68.5 million PCs, according to. I All right, so he's TNT looking at watching TNT. He's holding up a smartphone, <laughs> nothing in his up his sleeve, and he is going to unlock his smartphone with his nose on the fingerprint reader. <laughs> Unbelievable! It awesome. really has nothing to do with watching TNT, but TNT was playing while he did it. Uh, folks, I love it. I have nothing to say. It's like a TNT <laughs> fan of the day arms race. I, I feel like you're <laughs> really you're reaching is. peak fan. Yeah, and and you and you out there, you yeah, you know who you are. You can you can top that. Come on, uh, <laughs> maybe. Good luck. <laughs> anyway, how do you watch or listen to TNT, and how do you? Unlock your smartphone. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Lindsay Turrentine, what are you working on these days? We got a lot of great stuff. We're, we're in that post-Apple Watch period of, you know, we got Scott Stein continuing to test the heck out of that thing because he has it and nobody else does except all the other reviewers. So a lot of great content on that coming up. But we also have a really big package of tips for using your Galaxy phones because those are available now. Yeah. I've and they got a little overshadowed, but, shadowed, but a lot of good advice on using the, the GS6 and the Edge, which is, I have to say, 
an unbelievably beautiful phone. It's unbelievably beautiful, and it's got a stunning camera, and it's, you know, all the rest. But Samsung, don't ship on the day that Apple uh, does <laughs> their pre-orders for the Apple Watch. Nobody's going to know that you exist. So what are you going to do? Yep. Yeah, well, we, we did our best. Come come find, if you own one of those phones, come get some good advice. Yeah, well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for co anchoring today. We'll see you next time, Lindsay. See you next week. All right. You can subscribe to Tech News Today. You should subscribe to Tech News Today. Try it on Feedly, which is a great RSS reader, or you can choose some other way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can also watch us live, of course, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv. Or we have a bunch of apps and browser plugins you can choose from, which you can find at twit.tv slash apps. If you're ever in California, come on in and watch us as part of our studio audience. And you can follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You can follow me personally on Facebook at facebook.com slash mike.elgin. Let us know what you think. Send us an email to tnt at twit.tv or call 260-TNT-SHOW. And don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. And that is the tech news today, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.